you. All right. Wow, there we are. How is everybody today? I'm going to take this down because, you know, I believe preaching should be right down to you. Somebody say amen. amen. Let me tell you, I've been excited about your church. Pastor's been filling me in on what's going on. And so when I've been praying to come here, God really gave me a series of messages to preach to you. So this morning, I'm going to preach a message. And I'm going to really kind of open us up. I've gone all over the United States preaching. The Lord has allowed me to do that. And, you know, just saying you're a Christian doesn't mean you're a Christian. Somebody say amen. There's a lot of people that go to churches and they are familiar with Jesus, but they really don't know who he is. And so this morning, I'm going to tell you about Jesus, who he really is, and what you can expect from him. Tonight, I'm going to tell you who you really are. I know you thought you knew yourself, but I'm going to tell you who you really are. And then on Monday night, I'm going to give a message that is really kind of one to sum it all up. So would you do me a favor just for a moment? My tradition is, would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? We're going to put that first slide up, and this is where we're looking at. We're looking at Mark chapter 6. Verses 1 through 6. And the title here is A Broken Circuit. Now I want to read it for you. Would you put the next slide up and we'll read it. It says, Jesus said to them, Only in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own house is a prophet without honor. He could not do any, it says, he could not do any miracles there. This is his hometown. Jesus was a tremendous miracle worker. But in his own town, Nazareth, which Pastor and Don and I have been through, he could do no work. And it goes on and says this, Except he lay his hands on a few sick people and healed them, and he was amazed at their lack of faith. The next, start, next slide, if you will. And it goes on to say this, Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked, and what this wisdom, what's this wisdom that, that he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? And the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon aren't his sisters here with us? Yes, Jesus had at least seven siblings. Sisters here with us, and they took offense at him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today. I thank you, Lord God, for this great church. I thank you for the excitement that is building here. I'm thankful today, Lord God, as we kick off this revival. It's not just a, a, an evangelist with a suitcase that comes in one moment and then goes out the next. But this is something to revolutionize all of our lives. Lord, your word is power. I pray that your word would come down on us, Lord that we really understand who you are and what you can do for us today and the rest of our lives. Bless us, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Now, pardon my back as I turn here. I can't get my computer to be able to sync up, so I'm going to turn when I, when I read some of these scriptures. But I'm reading a book. The title of my message today is called A Broken Circuit. How many know a little bit about electricity? How many know a little bit about electricity to be dangerous? Okay, it's called A Broken Circuit, and I'll get to that towards the end, but I've been reading a book right now called, called this, Does God Believe in Atheists? Uh, in it, as the philosophers are, of mankind are trying to tell everything about God, and boy, you have so many opinions on who God is today. And so this atheist, is uh, this guy that was an atheist, turned to a Christian, and he started to write this book. And he's basing it on a, it's a philosopher of the 18th century, a German philosopher, and his search for God. Everybody is searching today. Every single one of the people on planet Earth Almost all 8 billion of them are on a search for something. God has put a GPS inside of us. We are, we are meant to worship. And if you don't worship the real God, you'll worship something fake. Somebody say amen. So he asks a question. That, he asks two questions. First one is, why is there something and not nothing? And that's a good question. Why do we have this and, not, and, and, and nothing? You know, the evolutionists would like to tell you, and I can't get into all of it tonight, today because I'll preach until tonight, and then you won't even have to go home. But uh, the evolutionists say there were two big balls of fire, two big balls of energy, and they came together, and it was a big bang. If you ask them where they got that from, they say, well, it was cosmic dust, and the cosmic dust collated, and that became those two big balls. Then you say, well, where did the cosmic dust come from? They can't answer you. So the truth is, if evolution is right, then something had to make itself. And I'd rather believe in God and worship Him than believe in dust and worship it. So he was asking the questions. The question was, who do you think God is? Your concept of God will either open up heaven and the supernatural to you this morning, or it'll shut it down. You can believe that there's a Jesus without understanding his power. You can believe there's a Jesus without re receiving his miracles. Obviously, the people in Nazareth knew that there was a Jesus. They knew him. They saw him every day of, their li of his life growing up. But they never received his power. Why is that? We're going to answer that question today. Why did they not receive this power, this great power? My concept of God and yours will either cause me to be a recipient of supernatural power. Not just know him, but know his power or a, or a skeptical observer. There's a lot of people that go to churches today all over America that come in and don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They don't believe the Holy Spirit. They don't believe in healing. I talked to one pastor. He was, I was telling him about my healing once. And he said, well, you really believe God healed you? I said, of course I do. 
What are you talking about? He was a pastor. So there's a lot of people who can go to church, call themselves Christians, and not believe in the supernatural power of God. The Jesus we worship today is according to the Salvation Army. They said, in Jesus, the divine and the human natures are united so that he is truly and properly God and truly and properly man. We say, Jesus was all God, all man. This is my hometown. We're talking about Jesus. Let's see that chart. That's my hometown, the next chart. That's Hazleton, Pennsylvania. That's where I was born. That's where I was raised. That's a sign going into greater Hazleton. One of my best friends growing up in Hazleton, Pennsylvania, was a guy named, would you put his picture up? Joe Madden. Joe Madden is, was, is I played Little League Baseball with Joe. I played, uh, played uh, baseball teeners with him. I played the Summer League Baseball with him. I played on, uh, baseball on the Hazleton, Hazleton High School with him. Joe was the leader, he was actually the coach of the Tampa Rays. Now he's the coach of the Chicago Cubs and has led them to a World Series. Matter of fact, in a couple weeks, Cheryl and I will be going to one of the games up in, up in uh, Pittsburgh when he plays the Pittsburgh Pirates. This is my, my friend, close friend in high school. Uh, he was a very close friend. He was the, he was, I saw him a few years ago in one of, our, uh, one of our class reunions last time I saw him. And it's really kind of strange to see Joe today uh, because it's strange for me to see his fame. Not him, but his fame. Because he's the same old Joe that I've known in, in school and I palled around with all through high school. You see, sometimes we can get blinded by familiarity. The world will kind of honor Joe, and they should because Joe's done a lot. But uh, to me, Joe, and Joe to me, and me to Joe, we're just two regular guys. My concept of Joe Madden has nothing to do with his fame and his popularity. I'm excited for Joe, and I've told him so on many occasions. Sometimes, when I'm traveling around the, around the United States, I come to cities and I see signs. And the signs sometimes will herald, herald their most famous people. Let's show, show the next one. You'll see this one. This is in Central City. This is in Tennessee. It's the home of the Everly Brothers. How many know the Everly Brothers? So I'm going to sing one of their songs for you now, okay? Just kidding. I'm just kidding. So you go there and you see it's the home of the Everly Brothers. Uh, there's another one. Would you put this one up? That is the, uh, Bill Clinton's bridge. It's dedicated to him. And it's a, it's a bridge that he actually did the dedication of. That's him in front of it. Um, it's a bridge that goes from uh, Memphis to Arkansas. By the way, it's fallen down. <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's prophetic. I have no idea. There used to be a sign when you went into Tennessee on one of the roads that said, Home of Al Gore. It's not there anymore. Maybe it was hurting our environment. I don't know. But it's not there. Most people are proud of their sons and their daughters that come from their hometown. I know in my our local paper that they wrote me up several times about things that I had done uh, that were national. But, you know, and, and so they're proud of that. They're proud of Joe Madden. They're proud of, they're proud of Al Gore. They're proud of Bill Clinton. They're proud of these men. These are from their hometown. So you can get this, this kind of pride that's there. But that's not always the case. Let me give you an example. It's not the case in our text this morning. Uh, it seems that the closer one gets to home, the less respected one gets who has achieved great status sometimes. It's especially true, uh, it, and it can, it can bind us, really, when we think about what we can do. Our value sometimes isn't appreciated by our family. Somebody say amen to that. It's not appreciated. You're not welcome in it sometimes. Even you speaking Christianity to some people who are unsaved in your family may not be welcome. So what about Jesus and the people? What did they think he was? Who did they think he was? Let me say it again. Our concept of God will either open up heaven and the supernatural or it will shut it down. My concept of God will either cause me to be a recipient of supernatural power or a skeptical observer. You see, lots of people put Jesus in their lineup today. There's a whole bunch of religions that have Jesus there. Let's show the Muslims and what they believe. Muslims call him Isa. They think he's coming back at the end of the age but at an Armageddon, believe it or not, and that he's going to bow down to the hidden, hidden imam. I got news for them. Let's show the next one. The next one is Mormons. Mormons say that Jesus and Satan are brothers and that, they, they, that God had relationships in heaven, celestial relationships. And the first one that came out was Jesus and the second one that came out was Satan and their brothers. That is the biggest lie that the enemy has ever told. He wishes. He's not a brother of Jesus. Then you have Jehovah Witnesses. They say 
and they deny the deity of Jesus. And they say that, uh, that uh, basically he was the first created being, just like you can be the next created being. He received his Godhead just like you're going to receive your Godhead. And then you have someone like the, uh, like the Buddhists who reject him right offhand. Uh, Buddhists believe, they say he, we must save ourselves. There's an inner consciousness that you can get. I told you, everybody's searching for something today, and the enemy's given them so many, so many different choices because we have a homing signal inside of us to search for God. Then there's the Hinduism. Hinduism, I like what they say, in a sense. They believe that the teenage Jesus traveled across Southeast Asia learning yoga and returned to Israel to be a guru to Jesus. Wow, how far out can you get? So who is this Jesus? Well, let me tell you, some people really do know him. I believe there's people in this church today that really do know him. The scripture says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says this. It says, the sun is the radiance of God's glory. The King James says, the express image. The radiance of God's glory. It talks about light and the exact expression of his nature. Sustaining, keeping all things together by his powerful word. After making purification for sins, that's the cross, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus is not a mere person. Jesus wasn't a good teacher, just a good teacher. He wasn't just a moral man. If you followed his, his teachings, you'd, have, you'd live a great life. But he doesn't want you just to live a great life here. He wants to take you someplace. You are on a journey. You are going somewhere. This is just a trial to get you to the next step. And in that trial, God wants to give you his supernatural power. I am not a nut. I am not somebody who's, who's flaky that thinks, oh boy, God's going to do this. No, I believe that the power of God is resident today. It's the same yesterday Yesterday, today, and forever. I believe if Jesus did miracles 2,000 years ago, he can do miracles today. I believe if the dead can be brought back to life 2,000 years ago, they can be brought back to life today. Let me tell you something. People will laugh at me, but John says in the Bible that if you believe in greater things than these, than what Jesus did, can you do if you believe? It takes your faith. You've got to bring your body in here, but you've got to bring your spirit in too. You've got to say, God, I'm ready for anything you have for me. Now watch, express image. I have three children, um, one of each, but I have three children. You didn't get that one, did you? Man, it's okay. More coffee, you need more coffee. I have three children, but they tell me all the time, whenever my children do something, it's usually not the good things they do, they tell me, Cheryl will say to me, well, you know, just like you, apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You've heard it, you've said it. Let me just tell you something. The Bible says that Jesus is the image of God, the express image of God. That word in the Greek is the word character. And we get our word character from it. It's his personality. It's his makeup. It's his expression. It's like we say, what a character. Jesus didn't look like God. God, believe it or not, doesn't have a body. He's not an old man with gray hair. That is a misnomer. That was done in the, in the Middle Ages. God, the Bible says, is a light that no man can approach. We have what's called an, an uh, anthropomorphism. We put, we put characters that we know on God so we can understand him. Example. He, he hides us under the shadow of his wings. You think God has wings? He does not. That's an anthropomorphism. His eyes go back and forth around the, around the world. God doesn't need eyes to look at the world. He is a light in a throne that no man can approach. Jesus is, not the, is the express image. He's the character. He's the nature of God. And what does Jesus want to do for us? He wants us to have that same nature. He wants us to have that same character. That's why we believe in Christ today. Not just to get us out of hell. Not just to give us an answer to our prayer so that we can become like him. Somebody say amen. The image of Christ. So when somebody sees you, they see the image of Christ. They see in all your flaws, they see Jesus over you. He changes you. He takes care of you in many, many ways, but he changes you. He did, listen, I want you to understand, which one of my three children do you think looks the most like me? You don't know my children, but if I asked Cheryl, she'd tell me which one looks the most like me. Matter of fact, it's my baby daughter. She hates it. People see her and they say, oh, little Mark Carell. She's 32. And, she, and she's like, Dad, I'm tired of looking like you. I said, I can't help it. What can I say? These powerful genes. So which one of us look the most like Christ? When somebody sees us, somebody says, well, they're acting just like Jesus. They're acting as a Christian. This is the key. Let me tell you, they tell me that my son's a chip off the old block. I don't even know what that means. 
Jesus is God in person, in human form. He laid the cornerstone. He set the silent singing stars in their courses. The Bible says everything was created by him, through him, and for him. So Jesus was there at creation. He was not born someplace. God didn't create Jesus. He always was and he always will be. He set the silent singing stars in their courses. And he kindled the flaming fires of innumerable suns. He measured the waters in his hands, the Bible says. And he meted out heaven with a with a Span. That's the distance from here to here in your hand. And, and he comprehends the dust of the earth in measure. It means he knows every single piece of dust in the earth. Listen to it. He weighed the mountains with a scale and the hills with a balance, the Bible says. Here's what God knew that took us thousands and thousands of years to know. I want you to understand. This, let it represent planet earth. There it is. Planet earth. It spins. How many of you know you're spinning right now? How many know you're spinning right now? I mean, how many of you don't know you're spinning right now? Come on. You're spinning right now. So you're going, how long does it take to get around, uh, get one day around? 24 hours. How fast do you think the earth is spinning to get around 24 hours? 1,000 miles per hour. Very good. Who said that? No doubt a science teacher. Okay, so that's one part of it. Let's go a little bit further. You're also traveling around the sun. And as it travels around the sun, it takes how many days? 364 and a quarter. How fast do you think you're traveling around the sun? Aha, I got the science teacher. 67,000 miles an hour. Okay, you're getting messed up right now so much? Okay, now, you are spinning every 24 hours at 1,000 miles an hour. You are traveling around the sun while you're spinning. Uh, it takes 364 and a half, uh, quarter uh, days at 67,000 miles an hour. And we are part of the... <laughs> going to really burn your brain right now. We are part of the, uh, uh, of, uh, the Milky Way. It has extended arms. It's the cluster, the middle one. When you look up in the sky at night, you see that big cluster. And we are, we are on one of these spiral arms, and we're traveling around the center of the galactic core. We are traveling around. It takes us 26,000 years to get around once. And guess how fast we're traveling around that? You ready? A thousand miles a second. Now, how many are just like totally confused? I told Cheryl coming up, she says, what? What are you talking about? Here's my, here's my, here's my point. Everything that has been created has been created with an order. Almost everything you see in life spins. Your atoms are spinning. They have little electrons around them. The, co the cosmos spins. We believe the universe actually spins. And so everything has an order. That's not evolution. That is the hand of God. Let me go a little bit further. The earth weighs, you ready for this? 12 to 10 to the 24th power. That means 12 or 24 zeros after it. That's how much the earth weighs. And it's not a very heavy thing compared to other things. The diameter from here to the center is 8,000 miles. And if you really want to understand a little bit more, God says he has the world in his hand. There it is. He's got it in the palm of his hands. Imagine. Now watch the orderly, creative design of God through Jesus. The earth has seven layers. Put them up, if you would. Seven layers. The crust is zero to 30 miles thick, the top part. Upper mantle, 30 to 300 uh, miles thick. It's called the asthenosphere. Then you have the transition region, 380 to 600 miles thick. That's the Mohorovic uh, discontinuum. I know it sounds weird, but listen, I'm going somewhere. You have the lower mantle, 600 to 200, 2,500 miles thick. You have the D layer, which is 2,500 to 2,700 miles thick. You have the outer core, this is right before the core, which is 2,750 to 5,000 miles thick. And then you have the inner core, a gaseous nuclear fireball at 5,000 to 6,250 miles thick. The crust, the top, let's go back, varies considerably in thickness. It's thinner in the oceans than it is in the, in the land. Matter of fact, it varies somewhere in a neighborhood of about, of about 0 to 30 miles in depth. And it's the thinnest in the oceans, thicker in that. You are standing on a crust right now that's only 6 miles thick. Alabama is only 6 miles thick. And so we know that the inner core and the crust, what we live on, are solid very much in the inner. The outer core and the mantle layers are semi-fluid. Now watch. The center core is completely made up of iron nickel. Uh, temperature at the center exceeds 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It is a nuclear ball inside of us. We're cooling down. It's hotter than the surface of the sun. Is anybody getting hot in here from spinning? Cyril said to me, how do, you, how do you explain that? We're spinning. We're going fast. I said, well, we're riding in a car now. See that little fly in the back? We're riding 70 miles an hour. See that fly back there? He's flying. How fast do you think he's going? She said, well, he's not even going two miles an hour. I said, no, but he's traveling 70 miles an hour. Yeah. That's right. 
okay, I know you guys are ready to say, okay, I got to have a break right now. Let's take a coffee break and let's just hang in there. I'm not even at my message. Hang in there. You still with me? Yes. Seven. The number seven. Perfect number we hear all the time. Listen, scientists will tell you, we have seven. We have seven elements that make up everything you see. This basketball, your body, those pews, everything you see, only seven elements. The other ones are traced, seven major ones. Iron, 34% of the globe is made out of iron. Oxygen, 29. Silicon, 15. Magnesium, 12. Nickel, 2. Sulfur, 2. Titanium, 1. And everything else is small. And so the earth is in its composition, the Bible says, is in a fallen state. We are in sin. We need a Savior. He created it perfect and it's fallen. This is rudimentary, but I want to bring you to someplace today. Interesting, when I took the se first seven letters of the seven elements, I-O-S-M-N-S-T, and I unscrambled them. You know what it spells? Most sin or I'm to sin. This is the planet we live on. You see, Jesus... You see, we live in a fallen planet, engraved with sin and the natural. Jesus was there at creation, the Bible says. He knew God's intention for mankind. Next slide, if you would. Listen to what it says. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. That's the beginning of it, the very beginning. That's the oldest verse in your Bible, by the way. Older than Genesis, because it tells us in the very beginning, speaking about something older, in the very beginning. Jesus is the express image of God, the engraved image of God come down to man. He brought heaven down to earth, the supernatural to the natural. He bridged the gap. The whole word for priest it means bridge. Jesus is our bridge. No man gets to the Father except through the bridge called Jesus. So he takes the supernatural down to us. He does things that people don't understand. He, he is the omnipotent God, all-knowing, oh, excuse me, all-powerful. He's omnip omnipresent everywhere at the same time. He's the omniscient God, all-knowing. So when he, come, when he comes, he does amazing things. The, he heals the blind, the deaf, the mute came to him, as did the crippled, the lame, and the possessed by demons. And they were all healed, every one of them, the Bible says. Even the dead were given life again by the healing power of Jesus Christ. There's no doubt that Christ was a healer, an, ex, an, an exorcist, and the image of God come down to earth. C.S. Lewis said this, and you've heard it. He said, to believe the claims of Christ, you had to believe he was either a, a liar, a lunatic, or a lord. Well, he wasn't a liar. He wasn't a lunatic, so he's got to be lord. He's lord over over everything, every single thing. And if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, then you and I can expect his miracles today. You and I can go to a revival service and say, I can leave here different than I came. You and I can come to a revival service and say, the problems of the world have come at me, but Christ is meeting my power, my problems. I want the same power of Jesus that he lived when he lived in, in Galilee that there is today. I want that power. I hear it all the time. Pastor Mark, where are all the healings that we read about in, in, in the Word? How many have ever been healed? There they are. How many have ever been saved from a, something that was going to take your life? I'll raise my, both my hands and my whole life. We know the healings are here, so why don't people get more of them? Why don't they enter in? His mighty acts of healing left a deep impact on the movement he left behind. But wait a second. What about Nazareth? How come he couldn't do any miracles in Nazareth? What was the problem there? What about... Churches today that claim to be Christian, but there's no miracles done in them, or they don't even believe. What, what's the problem? He calmed storms. Think about it. He calmed storms. He stopped the wind. He walked on water. Look at Mark 6 5. He says this He could do no, no, he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. Keep that one up for a second. So he calmed storms. He healed palsy people. He stopped the wind. He walked on water. Matthew Gospel quotes Jesus saying, All authority in heaven is given, and earth is given unto me. But in Nazareth? Nothing. Couldn't do a thing. How can we reconcile these two that seem so much at odds with each other, these two scriptures? Well, the omnipotent Christ, the Son of God, the exact expression, the exact expression of God, The exact expression of God, give me this one if you can. There you go, thank you. Could do nothing at all in Nazareth. Why? Why not? Mark's gospel is the shortest of the four gospels. It devotes most of the space to Jesus' mighty works. Mark is going to tell us about his mighty works, his miracles. In the chapter leading up to chapter 6, we see Jesus calming a violent storm. Look at it. Put that one up. So we see Jesus, he's there, and arose a great storm of wind. Pastor, you've been on the Sea of Galilee. 
That Sea of Galilee can whip up a massive storm. It was calm when we were there. Jesus walks in the water, and here's what he literally does. He says to the, sto to the storm, and I'm going to put it the way he said it, and I'm going to put it the way it really is in the Greek. He said, silence. In the Greek, it means it's this, shut up. So the storm calms down, and the rest of the night, the storm takes the, the time off. He tells us that. Then Mark's favorite word is immediately. It says, Mark's favorite word. Jesus was comforted with a man possessed of the multitude, uh, multitude of demons. In Mark chapter 5, verse 2 and 8, 8 and 9, let's read that one. It says this. It says, when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met a man of the tombs with an unclean spirit. He said unto him, come out of the man, the unclean, uh, the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, what's thy name? And he answered, saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. Obviously, demonic possession. Next verse, if you would. And it says, and immediately Jesus gave them leave, these are the demons, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. So what did Jesus say that caused them to enter into the swine? The Bible just says he gave them release. He didn't say anything. He could have just nodded his head. It's your time. He could have whistled. He could have pointed his thumb. He could have said, go or hit the road. Just get out. And so basically, whatever he did say, whatever the action was, he sent all of them into a herd of swine. All these, these demons into a herd of swine. I guess that's why we have deviled ham. I'm not sure. <laughs> then there's the daughter of Jairus and the woman with the issue of a blood. I know you know all of these, bleeding to death, miracle after miracle. And the word of Jesus has spoke, been spoken over the entire country. Everyone knew of his fame. And by the way, Israel's not that big. Israel's about the size from length, from one top, part, top to the bottom, from Birmingham to, probably from Birmingham to Montgomery. That's the size of Israel. Back to our text and where I want to go today. Jesus coming home to Nazareth. You would think you would have a local boy makes, makes hero type of banner. You'd think they'd do something like they did for Joe Madden. You'd think they'd do something like they did for Al Gore or something like they did for Bill Clinton. Name a bridge after him. But he comes back and instead of them heralding him, his fame is everywhere. They reject him. Outright reject him. Mark chapter 6, 1 to 3, let's go over it. And when he went out from thence and came into his own country, his disciples followed him. The Sabbath day was come, began to teach in the synagogue. Many hearing him was astonished, were going over it again. From when had this man come? He talks about their sisters, and he says, and they, at the end of it, and they were offended by him. Next verse. Next chart. Again. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin. And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went around about the villages teaching. Marvel, by the way, only twice did Jesus marvel in Scripture. And it was bo both times were at their unbelief. I think Jesus would marvel at what happen it's what's happening in American Christianity today. I think he'd marvel about all the churches that have his name out there on the sign, and they don't believe any of the miracles that are there. They don't believe the truth of it. I think he'd marvel at the fact that people live their lives by feelings instead of living their lives by the rules of God. I think he'd marvel when he sees that everything that's happening in our news and everything that's happening in a moral decline in America. I think Jesus would marvel when he, start, when he sees people saying, well, I believe in you, but they never enter into that next step. They never get to the same step of saying, God, I need a miracle. I'm believing in a miracle. I'm believing for something to manifest itself. I think he marveled to think, well, you, you went all that way, you came to church, you parked your car, you sat in your same seat, you listened to the message, and now you're going to go home the same way. I think he would marvel if he realized that there's people that come in and they don't expect anything from him. I want to come to church expecting. I want to come to church believing. I want to come to church that when I get in here, God's going to touch my life and I'm going to leave here different. I do not want to come to same old, same old, same old. How many messages do we have to hear? How many sermons? How many songs do we have to sing? We need the power of God, the message manifested power of God that Jesus can heal a life that Jesus can take care of a finance that Jesus can heal a marriage come on we need a God who operates we need a God who works not somebody we advertise as Christian we need Christ Amen. so the well, how could he and he could do no miracles there why well I got three answers to that question number one Jesus chose to do no miracles there he chose not to do any. In Romans 9, 13 to 15, you can put it up, I'm not going to read it all. It talks about, it talks about God saying that uh, all is written, uh, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. That word is not hate in the Greek, it's the word missio. It means I loved him less. Why do you love him less? Because he didn't trust him. Esau didn't trust God. He trusted his own mechanisms for getting through life. 
We, well, Pharaoh, his, same thing for Pharaoh. He, said, he talks about Pharaoh. His heart was hardened. Why was Pharaoh's heart hardened? Because he didn't open up to God. God gave him time and time again when Moses' miracles. And Pharaoh continued to think, well, you know what? I'm going to do this on my own. You cannot live your life on your own. It's impossible. You've got to realize that if you're trying to live your life on, the, on your own, you have made yourself at enmity with God. You are here because you need God. I need God. I don't care how much money you have. You can be a gazillionaire. You still need God. Listen. We know that Cain, Abel, we see it all through Scripture. Listen, Jesus is not out to prove himself to anyone today. He's not out to prove himself to anyone. Not even his family and his friends. He wasn't in Nazareth either. He could have proved himself to his family and friends. He's not out to prove himself. Imagine, it could have been his time to be somebody in the eyes of his family and his friends in Nazareth. Imagine you, come on, how many of you have ever gone home? Maybe this is your home, but how many of you have ever gone to a class reunion? Four of you? Is it the same class? No. How many of you ever gone to a class reunion? Don't you see people there that want to impress you? Come on, the ones that come in nice, they're going to tell you all these stories about what's going on and what they're doing in their life. Listen, Jesus could have done that with all of his power. He never did that. You might say that if he had performed some mighty works of power there, his friends, his neighbor, his family would see and they would believe. Is seeing believing? Listen, not according to C.S. Lewis. He wrote this, the experience of a miracle, and by the way, if you haven't figured out yet, I'm looking for some miracles today. If you haven't figured that out yet, that's where I'm going. I'm painting a picture for you, but I'm going there. He says... The experience of a miracle requires two conditions. First, you must believe in a normal stability of nature, things that are normal, which means we must recognize that the data offered by our senses recurs in regular patterns. And of course it does. We know that life goes on. It's pretty regular. He says you've got to believe that. Well, all of us believe that. Secondly, we must believe in some reality beyond the natural. If you want a miracle, you've got to believe in something beyond what you naturally see. The people of Nazareth had the first. They believed that the world operated in normal, regular ways. And that nature obeyed natural laws. Every scientist believes that. Every person believes that. But they did not have the second. They could not accept that Jesus was something outside the natural order. They knew him. They grew up with him. Some of them could probably have said, well, I remember changing his diapers. We know his sisters. We know his brother. We know, we know this Jesus. Well, who does he think he is? We know him. So listen, they knew him, they grew up with him. I even, they can even said that they helped change his diapers. Now you want me to believe that he does miracles? Get out of town. And that's what he did, by the way. You see, Jesus isn't looking to do miraculous for us just for himself. He's looking to do something for, for you today, for me today. But remember, whatever happens to you today at this altar will not be regarded as miraculous if you already believe that there's no such thing as the supernatural. That means if people get healed and you don't believe in healing, you will not get healed. That means if people speak in tongues and you don't believe in speaking in tongues, you will not speak in tongues. That means if people supernaturally fall over by the Spirit and you don't believe in falling over, then you won't fall over. And if you get healed, if you speak in tongues, if you fall over and you don't have a philosophy which includes the supernatural abilities of God, you'll doubt that that experience was from God. I've seen it over and over again. I don't know if that was God. I was just caught up in it. Listen, in Mark chapter 6, verse 5, it talks about Jesus, and it talks about him in a powerful way. He could do no miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick folk. Puny miracles. That's what I call them. By the way, the word in the Greek there means two. All he did was he laid hands on two people. It means he did, he did the miracles, but it was only for a couple people, just two. I don't want a puny Jesus today. I don't want a puny miracle today. I don't want one person over here on the left-hand side of the altar to get healed. I want to see everybody who has a need today, everybody that comes up to this altar, every single one of them get healed. Pastor, how could you even say that? Because I believe in Jesus. I believe that he is doing it for one. He can do it for all. I believe he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I don't believe he picks out this person and does something that picks out this person. You don't have because you don't ask. I want God to unload heaven today in this church. Your pastor told me you're primed. Do you know what that means? That means the gunpowder's loaded, the primer's in it. All you need is the spark of the Holy Spirit to shoot it. You're primed. You're ready. You've been here. You've been searching. So, so I'm not just here to preach a message and get out of town. I'm here to tell you, okay, let's light this candle. Let's get this thing going. Let's shoot this rocket. Let's, go, let's enter heaven and let heaven fall down to us. Let's really storm heaven. Let's get to the point where we believe that God is going to do something miraculous in my life, in your life. Come on. You see, because of their lack of faith, that's the second reason, the second explanation why I could do no miracle at Nazareth could be really a continuation of the first. The people, because 
because of their lack of faith. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. They had some faith, but not a whole lot. You see, because of their lack of faith, they wouldn't ask him to heal them. And we're going to give you an opportunity tonight. We're going to say, if you want more of God, you can come up to this altar. That's your choice. You can say, oh, I can. Or you can say this, my roast is burning. I got to get home. And that's up to you. That's fine. I'm not going to keep you a hundred years at this altar. That's not, my, that's not the way I, I operate. If God's going to heal us, he can do it just like that. If he's going to give us a miracle, it can be just like that. And I know what you're saying. Some people are skeptical, saying, I'm not really sure of that. Okay, I understand that. James was part of that group. The Bible says that James was there that day. James did not welcome Jesus there. He was an unbeliever at that time. James could have said, hey, this is my brother. Trust me, he's, he's really somebody that's great. But he was an unbeliever at that time. Later on, James becomes a believer. He becomes the leader of the, of the Jerusalem church. And in James 4, 7, he says this, you have not because you ask not. I'm sure he would probably tell you, I wish I would have asked for something that day. Listen, it's a first-hand insight. C.S. Lewis again says this, the Bible tells us that great miracles are possible through faith the size of a tiny mustard seed. Let me tell you something, when I take people into, into Israel, I'm not sure I do it, Pastor, sometimes I'll take them to a mustard seed bush. I don't know if I did, and I'll pull out a mustard seed flower. That's a mustard seed. The Bible says if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say that this mountain be removed and it will be cast into the sea. What what am I talking about today? You all have a measure of faith. You're here because you believe in God. But let me tell you, all you have to do is exercise that faith. You've got to use that faith. You've got to say, God, I want to reach out to you today like I've never reached out to you before. I'll tell you when I did, when I was desperate, I would reach out to him my whole life. I never backslid since the time I was saved. But when they told me I had seven months to live, I'll tell you what, it was the closest I got to God. And I was taking my faith every day and I was putting it in God. And let me remind you, God healed me. And I know what you're going to say. Well, what about the people that died? That's ultimate healing. If, he would have, if I would have died, I would have been with him and all my problems would have been over. But he healed that problem because God is an everlasting God. He's a God that can heal. He's a God that can touch. He's a God that can perform miracles. Yeah. I rebuild Harley Davidson's. And I don't do a whole lot anymore, but when I had one this one time, it was a beautiful bike. It was a 2005 custom chopper, chrome flames, s and &S. Well, it actually had a Harley engine, 1430cc Harley engine in it. And I was restoring it, took it all apart. Uh, it wasn't working when I got it, I took it apart probably 10 times. I had a problem with it, put it all back together, and it didn't work. So I put it, took it apart again, put in a new starter. I put in a new carburetor in, I got it reworked. A new wiring, new fuel system. And it would leak gasoline, constantly leak gasoline. I was afraid to drive it, that I was gonna be a human cannonball. And I was afraid it was gonna blow up under me. So I was so frustrated, and I don't usually pray for anything like that, but I said, God, just show me what's going on here. So I took the carburetor off that this guy was supposed to have redone, and I found a three-cent washer was missing. A three-cent washer. And the whole bike, and all the trouble I had trying to get it to start, didn't work because a little three-cent washer. Faith is a three-cent washer. Listen to me. Use it, and everything starts to work. Don't use it, and your life will just leak away. And you'll wonder what's going on. Three-cent washer. That's what it is. This is what God's asking for today. That's mustard seed. Three-cent washer. Same analogy. Imagine what miracle God is waiting to perform for you, but because no one asked, the miracle goes undone. The people of Nazareth had no faith. They did not ask to be healed, so they weren't healed. Lastly, my third possibility is also related to the first two. The title of my message. It's the other side of the coin. Another way to look at the same facts Jesus could perform no miracle there because the power to heal was conditioned by faith of those who desired to be healed. What does that mean? It means this. I told you it's a broken circuit. I brought my own lamp. Pastor wouldn't let me use his. He said it was holy. I said, just because it has a holy shade doesn't mean it's holy, Pastor. There you go. I want you to see something here, just for a moment as we get ready to close. Imagine the light bulb in here. There's a light bulb in there. If you're an electrician, you know this. What does this need to glow with light? Anybody know? Power. It needs electricity, right? Pretty easy. In order for our light bulb to glow, it will require a power source, an electrical circuit. A power source drives electrons through a wire. It drives electrons through a wire that come through this whole wire, go up to this light, and it works. It powers it up. 
where the energy is released. There's energy in that light bulb would be released by that power. The electrons then return along the wire to the source and complete the circuit. So a wire actually works this way. It goes in, it goes in one side. You notice there's two wires there. It goes in one side and it comes back out the other. And when it makes a full connection, it lights. A switch stops that connection. That light was on all the time, but the switch stopped the connection. The switch makes the wires touch. And as the wires touch, the full circuit goes through. Remember? A full circuit. Remember the title of my message? Listen, the complete circuit of God. Now watch. In your house, you have light switches all over the place. You have them here. It's a break in the circuit. That's what a switch is. It's just a break in the circuit. The wire is connecting, but the switch breaks it. When you turn it off, it breaks. When you turn it on, it, it hits it. Allowing the electrons to flow all the way through, providing you with light. I know you're saying, Pastor, I know all that. We'll wait. Sometimes the switch has different levels. I asked Pastor if he had, when we have these bulbs that have different levels, they can go for low, high, and higher. The power is always there. How many of you are getting this? Same power is always there. It's the bulb that makes it go low, high, and higher. Now watch, because that bulb is indicative to faith. In Hebrews 1.3, it says he's the express image, the brilliance of God. The Bible says that God is a light that no man can approach, and that Jesus is a conduit of that light. He is taking the power down to us. He was sending his power to the people. It, the people were, the, were the, the bulb, but the people had no faith in Jesus, and the circuit wasn't completed. They had no faith. The power was there. Jesus was there. He's standing there. Do you believe Jesus is in this church? Do you believe his power is in this church? Then why aren't you healed? Whoa. Do you believe Jesus can heal you? Do you believe Jesus can take care of any problem you bring him? Then why hasn't he? Now, don't, don't get down on yourself. Listen. The power comes in, and you have to be able to say, I want all of the power, or I just want a little bit of the power. When people go to church, sometimes they don't want it all. They're too scared. They're, they think it's, it's mumbo-jumbo. They think it's something else. The Bible says... The people never completed the circuit. The Bible says this. John, put that up one, one time for me if you would. John 1.5. I read this to you before. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were created by Him and not anything. And, and uh, it says all things were, were made by Him. In Him was life and the life was the light of, of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness didn't comprehend it. And it says, it goes on to say there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He was not that light, but he came to bear witness of that light. That through Him all men might be saved. Turn the next one up. This is what it says. He was in the world and the world made through Him, but the world did not know Him. He came to His own and his own received him not. That's Nazareth, by the way. That's churches in America. How many are with me this morning? Yes. I'm getting ready to, to give you something today as I close. So the question comes down to this this morning. Jesus was sent to work miracles among us. But will you complete the circuit? It depends on you. I think there's another... Let me see that next slide, see if I want to give that one. Yeah, look at this. But as many as received him, not who believed in him, not who knew that he was living. Many has received him, gave he power, dunamis, we had our word dynamite from it, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name. He's not just looking to give us miracles. He's giving out, who wants to give us sonship? Sonship means you can have access to everything he has access to. Joint heirs. Listen, Jesus is our A to Z this morning. He's able to do everything for you. Let me show you what it is. He's all we need. He has covered us from A to Z. He's A, the ancient of days that can create a miracle in you today. He is B, the babe of Bethlehem, ready to birth something new in you. He's the conqueror of any hurtful memory you have. He's the deliverer of prayers, petitions. He's the emancipator of present misery. He's the faithful one who provides a release. He's the giver of life, exchanging beauty for ashes. He's the hope of all the ages, pushing us past our present pain. He's the incarnate one, full of the mysteries of God. He's the justifier of our souls, freeing us from sin's grasp. He's the kinsman redeemer who shares in your present condition. El, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah, treading down your enemies of your life. He's the master of the universe, eliminating the maybes of your life. He's the next of kin, eradicating who you used to be. He's the omnipotent savior, providing the answer to man's problems. He's the powerful son of God, dispatching his help to the hearers. He's the quick and powerful sword, able to end your struggles to He's the redeemer of the world, waiting for man, all of man, to come to him. 
He's the soon coming king gathering the citizens of his kingdom. He's the triumphant one who masters all that life threw at him. He is the undying risen savior who will quicken your mortal body. He is the victor over death, over hell, over the grave, coming in majesty over the underworld. He's the witness of the father pleading our case before the throne. He's the extra man in the fire walking us through the devil's devices. He's yesterday's hope. He's today's dream. He's tomorrow's triumph. He's the zeal of Zion, zealously gathering his children for this present day harvest. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is my God. He is your God. He is a miracle worker today. He's the one that wants to release you today. He's the one that wants to take care of you today. And you just happen to come to the right place. Next chart, if you would. You are not who people say you are. You are what God says you are. Amen. You're a child of God. I don't care. You know what they told me when I was growing up in high school? They said, You'll never, he'll never amount to anything. They probably were right. By myself, I wouldn't have amounted to anything. Give me one last one. One last slide. I want to be so full of Christ that if a mosquito bites me, it flies away singing, there's power in the blood. <laughs> you know, people don't understand life. I'm going to call you to an altar in a moment, but I want to give you something first. Once upon a time, two twin boys were conceived in the same womb. Weeks passed and the twins developed. As their awareness grew, they laughed for joy. Isn't it great that we were conceived? Isn't it great to be alive? Together, the twins explored their world. When they found their mother's cord, was was, when they found their mother's cord that gave them life, they sang for joy. How great is our mother's love that she shared her own life with us. As weeks stretched into months, the twins noticed how much each was changing. What does it mean? Asked the first twin. It means that our stay in this world is drawing to an end, said the second. But I don't want to go, said the first. But maybe there's life after birth. But how can that be, responded the first. We will shed our life cord, and how is life possible without it? Besides, we have seen the evidence that others were here before us, and none of them have returned to tell us that there's life after birth. Nope, this is the end. And so the one fell into deep despair, saying, If conception ends in birth, what is the purpose of life in the womb? It's meaningless. Maybe there's no mother after all. But there has to be, protested the other. How else do we get here? How do we remain alive? Have you ever seen our mother, said the one? Maybe she only, she only lives in our minds. Maybe we made her up because the idea of, of made us feel good. And so the last days in the womb were filled with deep questioning and fear. Finally, the moment of birth arrived. When the twins had passed from this world into the next world, into this, in their world into this world, they opened their eyes and cried, for what they saw exceeded their fondest dreams and their imaginations. You are on a journey. You are headed towards the Father. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard. This morning, on your way there, Christ wants to take care of the miseries in our lives. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? Huh. You know, remember those seven letters of the composition of, of the world? I said I re-scrambled them. It says, most sin or I'm to sin. Those same letters actually sell, spell this too. Miss not. Don't miss it today. Don't miss everything that God can do for you this morning. This morning, I'm going to ask you as your heads bow just for a moment. If you don't know him, maybe you're a skeptic. I don't want to take anything for granted. Maybe you said, you know, I've gone to church. I've seen hypocrites. Trust me, church is full of hypocrites. We're all hypocrites. We all know more than we do. That's not a good excuse. Maybe he says, well, you know, I've tried, but I don't know. It just doesn't work for me. Well, I'm asking you today to tap into the, the creator of the universe. If you're here today and you don't know him as your Savior and Lord, maybe we're all saved, I don't know, but I don't want to take it for granted. Or maybe you've backslidden, maybe you've gone to a spot where you believed in him, but some doubt came in somewhere. And now when Jesus is in the church, he can do no great thing in you because your doubt has entered in. Would you raise your hand and say, Pastor Mark, that's me. I want to rededicate my heart to Christ. I want to give it to him for the very first time. I want to start on this journey. Would you raise your hand? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Christian, let me ask you a question. Be honest. You've come all this way today. Your car is parked in its parking space. <laughs> You've sat in the pew that you sit in all the time. But sometimes you go home and it's like, why is there so much trouble in my life? Now, let me remind you, Jesus doesn't eradicate all the trouble. But when you reach out to him in faith, he can take care of your need. So maybe you're here tonight and you've been given a, today and you've been given a diagnosis from a doctor. Or maybe you're living with a condition and, and you're wondering... Don't wonder. As long as you have breath, you have life. As long as you have life, God can heal you of anything that's there. So if it's you this morning, and you need a touch in your body, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet right now. Just stand. You need a touch in your body. Stand to your feet. 
Come on, use that faith. You don't get it if you don't ask. Maybe you're here today and your finances are so messed up it's not even funny. You, you need more Benjamins at the end of your month. And you're saying, God, I've prayed and I've prayed, but I really want to pray this time. I really want to, want to stretch out, especially after this message that your spirit gave. If you have need in your finances, stand up. Thank you, Jesus. Maybe you have trouble with your family. Could be immediate family, could be extended family. It doesn't matter what the trouble is, but maybe it's bothering you. Or maybe it's your children. Maybe they're away from God. Or maybe it's someone you've been praying for. Stand up. There's other needs. Think about your needs. Think about the la this last week what you've prayed. Think about it. And think about God answering that prayer today. Stand up. You've been praying for something. It's not been answered yet, but you're ready. Stand up. All right, here's the last one. If all you want today is more of God, I'm going to ask you to stand up. More of God. It's all you want. So this morning, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Faith takes action. James said, you have not because you ask not. I didn't tell you anything that you didn't know today. I told you something of who Jesus is so that you can know him better. So this morning, if you have a need, maybe it's a person you're praying for, maybe it's health, maybe it's finances, maybe it's emotion, I'm going to ask you to come up out of your seat. And I'm going to ask you to do this. I'm going to ask you to come believing that Jesus is going to take care of your need. Believing that you're going to get a miracle from him today. Come on, come up. The timing is his, but you have to ask. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And here's what I want you to do. You've prayed. Jesus knows you. He loves you. He wasn't there to argue with Nazarenes. He wasn't there to chide them and tell them they had little faith. He just quoted the fact that they did. He was there to help them. But you can't help somebody that doesn't want any help. And so today, you know where our sign of help is? It's a real interesting one. You've been doing it for a long, long time. Here's our sign of help. Help me. Open your arms. Lift them up to heaven. Open up heaven, God. Lord, I pray right now that you just open up heaven, Lord Jesus. We believe you, Lord God. We're excited about you, Lord Jesus. Help us not to doubt, Lord God. Lord, let us have faith as a grain of mustard seed. Applying it, Lord God putting it in the ground, sowing it to you, Lord God, that the increase would be from you. Lord, I pray today, Lord God, for all of those that have come. Look at these people. Look at all of them, Pastor. Look at your people. They're needy. They're asking. Do you think God's going to say, look down and say, oh, no, I'm, I'm going to do this one and that one. Not. No. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same to me as he is to you. And today he wants to meet your needs. So I'm going to ask you to do something else. With your hands raised up, I'm going to ask you to cry unto him. Sometimes we just don't do that. Just speak unto him today. Talk to God today. Can you do that? Maybe you're unfamiliar with doing that, but just lift your hands up and pray. You can pray. Don't worry about anybody who's next to you. Father, I'm doing it right now. Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for today, Lord God. Touch your people, Lord Jesus. Oh, God. Lord, for every man, Lord God, every woman, every child, Lord God. I pray a need, Lord God, that will be met, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Praise your name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Bless your name, oh God. Touch, oh God. God, it's only you can, Lord. In Jesus' name, thank you, Jesus. Praise your name, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, just right now, Lord God, touch him, Lord God. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Praise your name, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Touch is only you can, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Praise your name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your name, Jesus. Touch, oh God, as only you can, oh God, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, oh God, in Jesus' name, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Praise your name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Bless your name, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Touch, oh God, as only you can, oh Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Praise your name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. God, we expect a miracle today, oh God. I'm going Santa. I'm going today, Santo. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Praise your name, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise
praise your name, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Bless your name, oh God. I'm going to must see today. I'm going to must see today, son. Touch as only you can, Lord. In Jesus' name, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your name, oh God. I'm going to must suit that about you today. Lord, miracles are needed today, oh God. In Jesus' name, oh God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Bless your name, oh God. I'm going to must suit that. I'm going to must see that. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Touch, oh God. It's only a candle, God, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your name, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Cheryl, Cheryl. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Praise your name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Praise your name, Jesus. Touch, oh God. It's only you can, Lord. Miracles, oh God. Miracles, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. You're the same, oh God. We believe in you, Lord. We believe, oh God. Amana masuta. Isamana masitri sando. Shamana makite. Uratata pasuta. Thank you, Lord God. Bless you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Praise your name, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Touch as only you can, oh God. Amana masuta. I amana masita de sando. Shamana masuta la bakite. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your name, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your name, oh God. Amana masuta la bakite. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Praise your name, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your name, oh God. Amana masuta i samana makite. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Praise your name, oh God. Touch, oh God. It's only you can, oh God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Touch as only you can, oh God. In Jesus' name, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your name, oh God. In Jesus' name, oh God. Give the desire of the heart, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your name, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your name, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen, my son. Amen, my son. Amen, my son. Amen, my son. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Praise your name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Bless your name, O oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your name, O oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Bless your name, O oh God. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Praise your name, O God. Amana Masuta. Samana Masita. Shamana Masita. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your name, Jesus. Touch, O God. Heal bodies, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Give strength, O God, as only you can. Amana Masuta. Thank you, Lord God. Amana Masanta. Shamana Masita. Sanda la Bakite. Touch, O God. Lord, the desires of this heart, O God. Thank you, Jesus. God bless your name, O oh God. I'm going to Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your name, O oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Listen, your hurts today are gone. All the things that hurt are gone today. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Bless your name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Praise your name, Jesus. Bless your name, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Touch, oh God, so you can. Thank you, Lord God. Masuta. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your name, O oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Everything, O oh God. Give it all to us, O oh God. Thank you, Lord God. Lord, touch this family, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your name, O oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Bless your name, O oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your name, O oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Touch, O oh God, as only you can. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.
you, Jesus. Bless, oh God, as only you can, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your name, Jesus. Touch as only you can. Thank you for this family, Lord God. Touch, oh God, Jesus. Everything, oh God, they've been praying for, oh God. Let them feel it today, oh God. Let them know the answer's right there, Lord. Touch them. Thank you for their faith, oh God. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your name, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Bless, oh God, as only you can, Lord. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, for your power, your presence, oh God. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your name, O oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. How many feel the Lord this morning? How many feel the Lord? How many believe that God's going to answer your prayers today? Man. Thank you, Pastor, for this opportunity. But going around among you, going around among you, I see specific needs. Like this woman over here that's been hurt, and I'm not going to point to her, it's been hurt. I can see specific needs where God's going to take care of those hurts in her life. I spoke to many of you and told you that. You know why? It's not because of me. It's not because of Pastor. It's because you're open to God. You're using that little seed of faith, and God's coming. I believe everything I read in that word. Somebody say amen. amen. Today, this morning, I told you who God was, who Jesus is, and what he can do for you. Tonight, I'm going to tell you who you are in him. Mighty warriors. Turn to somebody and say, you're a mighty man of God or a mighty woman of God. Tonight, we're going to see that. Can we close in prayer, Pastor? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Father, today, Lord, we love you. Thank you, Jesus. We believe today, God, that you have given us a word that came from you. Thank you, Lord God. us today, God, that Lord, it's up to us. The power is available to us, Lord. As long Thank as we're Jesus. connected to the, to the power source and as long as our Thank faith lasts the circuit. Thank you, Jesus. Today, God, I pray that, Lord, even this afternoon, as we leave Thank here you, Lord this God. afternoon and we get Praise your name, pray Jesus. a short break to rest up. Thank you, Lord God. And we're going to come back tonight with some thoughts about our faith. Thank we're you, Lord back God. Tonight, Lord, Praise your name, Jesus. With some thoughts about how Thank you, Lord want, God. We want you to just Thank fill you, us Jesus. up, God, with how that, that Thank faith you, does make that Thank circuit you, Jesus. up. We want that complete Thank circuit you, in our lives so that we can get the fullness. Thank you, Jesus. Fullness, Lord, Thank you, Lord God. To us. We can shine Thank you, Jesus. Thank Lord, you, Lord, I pray God. today, God, that what you're going to be exalted Jesus. this morning Thank you, Lord God. It's brought healing, and I pray, God, that touch people that's Thank broken. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray today, God, that in our altars that people Thank have given some things to you. Thank you, Jesus. Some repentance Thank has you. started. Lord, I need some have been filled with your spirit. Thank you, Lord God. Lord, today we give you all the glory. And we ask you, Lord, to just continue Thank to let your life shine through us. Thank you, Lord God. God bless you, everybody. Be sure to thank Mark Carell for one of the messages this morning. Can we give the Lord a good time?